Les presento ya a la profesora que ahora nos va a dar la conferencia. Se trata de Amanda Renshaw. Es directora editorial y subdirectora de publicaciones de Fidon Press. Desde el año 93 se ha encargado de la edición de numerosos libros de arte y fotografía, siendo la coordinadora de grandes proyectos como el libro del arte del siglo XX, por el que obtuvo el premio Book of the Year en el año 94, o su obra ahora como autora, además de como editora, con, una fuerte, con un fuerte contenido didáctico y especialmente pensado para educar desde la infancia y traducido al español en el 2007, con el hombre El ABC del arte para niños. Pero su obra esencial por la que hoy está invitada en este curso eh, es la titulada 30.000 años de arte, la historia de la creatividad humana a través del tiempo y del espacio, un magno proyecto que propone una visión global alejada de la perspectiva occidental que durante siglos ha dominado la historia del arte. Amanda Reichold nos dará las claves de esta audaz nueva concepción enciclopédica en donde prima un relato visual de una libertad extrema, un producto de diseño y divulgativo, además de anónimamente periodístico, donde se han prescindido de los autores y que se convierte en una cadena sin fin de imágenes a modo de creativa historia del arte. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Amanda Renshaw. I think Nuri explained that to you already. Um, and first of all, I'd like to apologize for not being able to speak Spanish. Um, I know what a nuisance it is having to wear those headphones. Um, who of you actually speak English in the audience? Who of you can actually understand me without them? Ooh, oh, that's okay. That's encouraging. That's good. <laughs> Um, but uh, Patricia's up in the box, so for those of you who don't understand, um, she's going to translate and try and help me explain um, uh, about this book. Um, Fiden Press um, is, I'm editorial director and deputy publisher of Fiden Press. Fiden Press was started in 1923 in Vienna um, by two very brilliant men, Bella Horowitz, who had a great head for figures, and uh, Ludwig Goldscheider, who was somebody who had a fantastic interest in the arts, and together they made a great couple, a really good pair, um, and created this publishing company, which um, has existed... Ooh, water, great, thank you very much. Uh, since 1923, they were Jewish, and in the 30s they had to leave Vienna, and they set up the company in London. And in the 40s and 50s, Feiden was a very, very important and influential publisher and really transformed art book publishing. It was one of the first uh, presses, first publishing companies to make illustrated books on art at a um, very accessible price. Um, and so that was in the 40s and 50s. In the 60s, the two partners died and the company was taken over by um, Horowitz's daughter. And the company lost its way a little and in the 80s um, was owned by lots of different people and in fact it went bust. It went into receivership in 1990 and was bought by the present owner then, 19 years ago. And we have tried to rebuild it in that 19 year period into one of the preeminent visual arts publishing houses in the world. Um, so that's a little history about Fiden Press, and now I'm going to turn on to something a little bit more personal. Um, when I was about 13, um, I remember um, being asked, my parents lived in Brussels at the time, and I was asked to take my aunt uh, to the museum. I was a bit annoyed, I was 13, I didn't really want to have to go and take my aunt around the boring old museum. Um, and, but I did, because I was a dutiful daughter, and um, I got bored. I followed her around for a bit, and she went from room to room, and she was so slow, and I went ahead of her sometimes, and then at one point, I actually went ahead of her and went around the whole museum and came back and found her in the room. I came behind her, and I stood at the entrance of the room, and I watched her looking at a picture, and she was crouched down, her shoulders were sort of crouched, and she was looking at this picture very intently, very, very close to the picture. I was a teenager, I got a little embarrassed. I thought, God, you know, she's going to set the alarm off any second, the guard's going to come in. Um, in fact, she didn't. 
I seem to be the only person who actually noticed her at all. And as I watched her intently, I saw that a tear fell down her cheek. And I thought, God, that's amazing that somebody can look at a picture and it makes them cry. Anyway, I pretended not to sort of notice and uh, she slowly walked on. And um, I went to look at the picture that she was looking at and it was this. I looked down at the label and it said, Petrus Christus, the lamentation. And I thought, how can this make somebody cry? This isn't a picture about real people. She didn't know anybody in the picture at all. Um, what, what was it? I couldn't understand. And so I stood there, not knowing anything about the period it was painted in, anything about the technique, not very really much about the subject either. Um, I mean, I'd been to church and I'd been confirmed and that kind of thing, but I hadn't paid much attention. And um, I tried very consciously to see whether I could let this paint, painting do something to me, make me feel something. Um, it didn't. It didn't, I have to say, when I was 13, it didn't. However, that small event did actually change my life because for the last 25 years, I have now stood in front of paintings, abstract, figurative, old masters, Renaissance, modern art, and tried to let a picture speak to me. What is it, even though I don't know anything about who it was painted by, why it was made, what period it came from, what does it do to me? What do I feel when I look at it? Um, and it's made me realize also that however good a reproduction may be in a book, or however high resolution an image may be on a screen, that there is nothing the same as looking at a work of art in the flesh. Absolutely nothing. Um, this makes books on art quite difficult. We can't replicate on paper uh, what we might see in a museum or a gallery. Excuse me, I'm just going to move the things around here a bit. Um, I hope I'm not talking too fast for Patricia. Can everybody understand what I'm saying? Um, so this makes making books on art quite difficult. We can't replicate on paper what we might see in a museum or a gallery. A painting or even a building reproduced on a page is one step removed from the original. To make the point clearer, a photograph is not one step removed, sorry. It's the real thing. Nine times out of 10, a photograph is supposed to be reproduced on paper. So seeing a photograph reproduced in a book is just about the same as seeing it hanging on the wall of a gallery. The same does not apply with painting or sculpture. So what do we do with the art we have in books? Well, what benefit is it to have art reproduced on sheets of paper and bound together? What can we do with art in art books? Well, we can organize it. Some individuals are better at organizing art than others. Ernst Gombrich was able to make, take a group of, work of art, group of works from all periods in history, organize them in an order that was pretty much chronological, and dictate the story of art to his secretary. After only a few sittings, the secretary dutifully typed it up, and this manuscript became this book, The Story of Art, one of the most read introductions to art history ever written. Gombrich weaves a narrative that describes the development of art as though he were telling a story. In a single, unfurling narrative, he describes things like the development of perspective from Simone Martini's very, very flat enunciation with that gold background, to Piero's less flat enunciation with an with a, um, architectural space behind it, to Benozzo Gozzoli's receding amazing landscape here in the Palazzo Medici Riccardi in Florence. Gombrich's is a traditional way of explaining art. But there are also other ways of cutting the art cake. In 1994, we looked through the archive of pictures that we had at Feiden Press and decided that we could make a reference book if we selected 500 artists from the Renaissance to today. 
if we selected a single work by each artist and organised the artists in A to Z order. This simple system, it was called the art book. And this simple system meant that for those readers who may have heard of Rembrandt, but didn't know which period to find him in in Gombrich's book, they could just look, on, look him up under the letter R. It meant that you found Hugo van der Goes next to Vincent van Gogh, and Picasso sitting side by side with Piero della Francesca. Several years ago, so those are two ways of cutting, as I say, the art cake. Several years ago, we were given the task of coming up with another simple but different idea for an art book. It was actually after the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001. And to anybody watching the news at that time, it was obvious that we can be totally unaware of other cultures or of what is really going on in all parts of the globe. And the way that art history is taught doesn't help us. Art history has always been taught as separate strands. Lots of strands of cultures, single strands that run parallel to each other, that hardly ever run into each other, they hardly ever cross over. We learn about European art, African art, Chinese art, Spanish art, French art, American art, but we learn about them all separately. And we have very little concept of what was happening around the globe at the same time. Take a span of about two decades um, from about 350 years ago. For example, during that period, an artist who we all know called Diego Velasquez was painting a family portrait of King Philip IV of Spain. This painting is one of the most complex works of art ever made and one of the masterpieces of Western art. And without simplifying it um, too much, um, it's physically big, just over three meters high, nearly three meters wide. It shows Philip's blonde-haired daughter, the Infanta Margarita, at the center of the composition in her white dress and red trim. She's surrounded by her attendants and maids, and reflected in the mirror on the far wall are her parents and the king, the king and queen. In addition to these members of the royal household and their attendants, there is another person in the painting, not hidden at the back, not close to the, but close to the front, standing proud, holding a paintbrush in one hand and a palette in the other. Velasquez included himself in, his fam in this family portrait. This very conscious decision was made, no doubt, to make a statement about his own importance in the royal family. But it also tells us of the status of the artist in 17th century Spain. While Velasquez was painting um, this portrait and asserting his importance and putting himself on the same level as his king, about seven and a half thousand miles away in India, a man whose name we will probably never know was crouched on the floor of a workshop. With incredible skill and dexterity, he carved this exquisitely delicate cup, small enough to hold comfortably in the palm of your hand. Seen here actually turned upside down so that you can see the detail. It's made of precious white jade with a goat's head for a handle and a stand in the form of a lotus flower. This translucent, beautiful vessel was designed for the hands of one of the world's most powerful leaders. This leader, called the Shah Jahan, which means king of the world, was the supreme ruler of the Mughal Empire, one of the largest and most powerful empires that has ever existed. Like King Philip, he was also a great supporter of the arts and is also known to us as the man who commissioned one of the most famous monuments ever built, the Taj Mahal. These are two very different works of art, one monumental, the other small and delicate, one made by a painter whose name is famous, the other by someone whose name we will probably never know. They were both, ba ma both made for powerful readers, made in two very different cultures, thousands of kilometers apart, but they are both masterpieces of human creativity. Another 5,800 kilometers to the east, and about the same time in Japan, 
Another court artist, Toza Mitsuoki, who also worked for an emperor, or a leader, a great important leader, was creating scenes like this one, with scrolls of poetry attached to a maple tree. And coming back west a little, in Tibet, an unnamed man was making this tiny, 11 centimeter tall Buddha sitting on the top of a skull. And zipping again back further west um, to Europe, and Johannes Vermeer in Delft was painting domestic scenes imbued with light and silence. 30,000 years of art tells you what is going on in art all over the world at the same time. 1,000 works of art organized in chronological order, regardless of where they come from. The book takes you from the Lion Man on the left, one of the oldest known sculptures in the world of a two-legged figure with the head of a lion, to a work that is still not finished, The Roden Crater on the right, by American artist James Terrell. Organized in simple chronological order, with one work per page, this book tells the story of human creativity across time and space. I'm going to take you through um, a selection of the works as they appear in chronological order. Each work was chosen for its unique contribution to the development of the history of art, or because it is representative of its culture at that time. By consulting with academics, curators, historians, and other specialists in their fields, we came up with a list of over 5,000 possible entries for the book. After a long process of discussion, consideration, some additions, but an awful lot of eliminations, we fixed at 1,000 works. We then systematically organized them in chronological order. If their date was uncertain, we took the midpoint. So for example, if something was dated circa 1000 to 2000 BC, we placed it in the book at circa 1500 BC. These 1000 images, paintings, frescoes, sculptures, pots, textiles, figurines, masks, vases, manuscripts, from all over the world, when arranged in strict chronological order, show us human creativity across time and space. Each work, no matter what its size, is treated in the same manner, with a single page all to itself. Although, as I said, works in a book can never look the same on a page as they do in the flesh, a book does have many benefits over a museum. It can include enormous things, like the Hall of Bulls from the caves at Lascaux, here on the left, and tiny things side by side. It can also include works from collections all over the world. This crouching figure is from the Archaeological Museum in Volos. The Iranian ritual bowl on the left is from the British Museum in London. It can also bring the outside inside. These fabulous Dabu giraffes, rock engravings that are carved onto a rocky outcrop in the Air Mountains in the Niger are also in the book. This portrait of King Akkad, one of the earliest portraits of Mesopotamian art, is from the Iraq Museum in Baghdad. This priest king on the left from Pakistan is from the National Museum of Karachi. The Egyptian portrait of a mother and her son from the Sixth Dynasty belongs to the Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York. This beautiful, rather sexy dancing girl with her hand resting provocatively on her hip is from the National Museum in New Delhi. And she sits next to three delicate figures with amazing headdresses or hairstyles that are painted on rocks and still in situ in the Dodoma region of Tanzania. On the lower right-hand side of every page, we are told where the origi work originates from, what it's called, if we know who it's by, who it's by, what it's made of, its size, its current location, and below, we list the movement, culture, and or style that it represents and the date it was made. Each entry includes a concise, descriptive text that sets the work in context, explaining its contribution to the development of art and the medium in which it was created. 
The country that you can see actually at the top of that little column on the lower right hand side um, is uh, where the place, the place where the work originates from, and it's always the country as it's known today. As geographical and political boundaries have changed quite a bit over the last 30,000 years, we thought it was the most sensible route to follow. Um, but it also meant that sometimes it was very difficult to identify a specific country. For example, we just couldn't place this extraordinary scar-faced man. There's some debate as to where he actually came from, the Fars region of Iran or the Oxus civilization that occupied northern Afghanistan, southern Uzbekistan, and western Tajikistan around 22,000 to seven, uh, 2200 to 1700 BC. It was impossible to establish which specific place he came from. So we left his place of origin to Central Asia. This is the only non-specific country reference in the book. As we pass through the ages, we come across some beautiful and sometimes amusing creations. One of my favorites is the Egyptian dancer. It's clear that its author was well-trained and talented artist, but the precise function of the drawing is not certain. It may have been a working sketch made in preparation for a painting in a tomb or a relief carving on a temple wall. Or perhaps it was drawn by a master painter to explain an idea to an apprentice. It may have been a copy made from an existing temple or tomb relief or painting, which was intended to be kept for future reference. Or it could have been made for sheer pleasure, to display the artist's ability to create a beautiful picture. The book includes another acrobatic figure from a different culture, Mexico. Again, we're not entirely sure what the function of this contorted man with his feet on his head was. The scientific chronology of the book makes for some interesting pairs on a spread. I rather like this juxtaposition of the figure on the left from the Curayacu culture in Peru and the small bust called the Prince of Malik, Malik from, on the right from Iran, both with their arms held in front of their bodies. Hers resting on her belly as if to draw attention to her reproductive capabilities, and he in a state of repose. She more masculine than him, and he more feminine than her. Or this, what I call the hat spread. The mother god, Sibele, on the left, with her impressive headdress, offering us a piece of fruit, and this 6th, 6th century BC warrior from a necropolis near Capistrano in Italy. The figure, the warrior on the right, stands in a stiff pose, his arms folded across his ribs and abdomen. Pillar-like struts extend from behind and beneath his arms to merge with the plinth on which he stands. The outer face of each strut is carved with a spear, which you can't actually see here. The left bears a cryptic inscription, presumably naming the heroic warriors, naming the person who, who we see depicted. A sword hangs over the warrior's right shoulder and chest, and he wears necklaces and armlets. The statue is dominated by its huge, separately carved, broad-rimmed headdress, and the facial features are sketchy, and only shallowly carved into the cylindrical head, giving his face a sort of strange mask-like effect. The best preserved survival of sixth century BC Piscine people, this statue has been described by some scholars as the most important ancient sculpture to have been discovered in central Italy. And it's thought to have marked the tomb of a warrior and ruler of the Piscine culture of central Adriatic coast. Of course, in the book, there are some periods where the art and culture is so prolific that there may be two works on the same spread from the same place. Greece, for example, during the early classical period. But while the Greeks were carving Athena in stone and making extraordinary images of athletes, known here from a Roman copy, somebody in Nigeria, of the Sokoto people 
was working in terracotta and creating this beautifully sophisticated head with its heavy eyebrows. Not much actually survives from this culture, although the sophistication of the works like this imply that the Sokoto artists were prolific. The dearth of art left behind is probably due to the fact that the works were mostly made in fragile terracotta like this one and not in marble or bronze. So we know very little about some cultures represented in the book. As I mentioned previously, our first list of possible candidates for the book amounted to about 5,000 entries. And it took a cast of 44 academics and art historians and an editorial team of 10 to bring it down to the more manageable 1,000. It was an enormous amount of time, it took many, many years to make, and uh, an enormous amount of debate went into um, what was included, what wasn't included, and even though taking it down from 5,000 to 4 to 3,000 to 2,000 was relatively uh, easy, when you got to 1,050, the 50 that you kept in or left out was a little bit more um, difficult and caused many, many heated debates. Um, the book teaches us that when the Romans in Egypt buried their dead, they made quick sketches of the deceased onto the very casket that they were buried in. While in North America at the same time, the Hopewell Indians buried their dead with oversized, minimal and stylized hands made in precious metals like this. This, and well, it's just one of my favorites, Part of a mosaic floor in a villa in Sicily just proves that the bikini was not discovered by the French engineer Louis Réard in 1947, as he claimed, but it existed hundreds of years ago before he was even born. Um, around 650 AD, we discover how pre-Angkorian Khmer people of Southeast Asia in Vietnam depicted their four-armed god and how in Europe in the Merovingian period how Christ was depicted. And you'll see here he's actually depicted without a beard, which is quite interesting. The hunter-gatherer peoples of the Dinwoodi tradition were scraping strange figures that resemble aliens more than human beings onto the rocks of the Bighorn River Valley in Wyoming in America, North America. And at the same time, an artist or craftsman in Italy was creating his own procession of women in stucco above the doorway of a church. More processions come in the form of the colossal Mai figures of Easter Island or the Toltec warrior columns on the right, with their butterfly pectorals, feathered helmets, tied loincloths, and sandals. Interesting footwear for a warrior. Of course, another prolific period that produced a large amount of extraordinary art, we saw a spread from Greece, um, is that of the Northern Song Dynasty which flourished between 960 and 1127 AD in China. It is regarded as the period when Chinese painting became of age. Certainly, the popular form of landscape painting reached new heights of sophistication. This is due to the influence of differing philosophies on the way in which people both saw the act of painting and the paintings themselves. Not least among these philosophies was Taoism, which held, which believed that humans are but a tiny speck in the vast cosmos. The landscape painting we see was seen as being a way of communing with nature and appreciating this vastness. One of the chief proponents of this outlook was Guo Xi, who lived between 1020 and 1090 AD, and he argued that the best pictures should stir the viewer's imaginations, imagination and emotions. One of Guoxi's best works is Early Spring, 
from 1072, seen here on the right. Painted on a length of silk and using no more than brush, ink and water, he conjured up pine needles of the deepest black and swathes of pale grey drifting mist. Human beings and their artifacts take up their insignificant places amid the enormity of mountains, waterfalls, boulders and trees. As with many paintings such as this, age has discolored the silk and is now a sort of gentle ochre colour. But Guauzzi's brushstrokes still convey the majesty of the mountain landscape. And it's easy for us, I think even today, nearly a thousand years later, to become lost in contemplation as it would have been for a Taoist master nine centuries ago. Again, the serendipity caused by the chronological order puts together two images from such different places, France and Peru, imbued with such different meaning that are apparently doing the same thing. Or suddenly hands become important. The golden arm covers buried with their dead owner in Peru or these, this tiny chess piece, one of 93 pieces, the queen with her hand held to her cheek. I suppose she's hoping it's not going to be checkmate. Sorry, bad joke. Um, going to ch back to China and Japan, a simple, monochrome, modern-looking stoneware vase from the southern, southern Song dynasty around 1200 AD, Sits, ne sits next to Kuya on the right. Kuya was an itinerant Buddhist priest who lived in civil war-torn Japan of the late 12th century. In a period where militaries could accrue good karma by founding temples and commissioning icons, but the common man seemed unable to ensure his rebirth in paradise, Kuya wandered from village to village dressed in a simple black robe, striking his gong and telling people that the Buddha of infinite light required only one thing to grant the believer a glorious rebirth into the next life. All you had to do, he said, was chant the phrase, Namu Amida Butsu, hail to the Amida Buddha. And here we see Kuyo with his, you can see his gong hanging around his neck and this little sort of pipe-like thing that emerges from his mouth, which could represent the phrase that he used to chant. This sacred king of Yoruba, from modern-day Nigeria on the left, looks as if he could have been made yesterday with his almond-shaped eyes, strong nose with flared nostrils and full lips. In the Yoruba culture, the head is thought to be the centre of an individual's essential character and life force. This strong face has qualities identified with leadership, calm, pride and patience. And although it's not entirely sure what these heads were used for, and there are many of them, it's been suggested that they were intended for display on altars. Ganesh, a Ganesh from uh, Indonesia is on the right. Ganesh was the elephant god. Um, he was made here about 1250 AD and he sits on a bed of skulls with the soles of his feet pressed together. Um, according to Hindu belief, Ganesh was the son of the god Shiva. At his birth, Shiva accidentally dropped his son on his head and um, he was fatally damaged. Shiva's bull, Nandin, decapitated an elephant, presented the head to Shiva, who affixed it to the body of his son. And this is him, Ganesh. On to Russia, and the most respected painter of his time, Andrei Rublev's icon of the Holy Trinity from about 1411, was created only a few years before one of the greatest examples of illuminated manuscripts of the international Gothic style, the Très Richeur du Duc de Berry by the Limburg brothers. In 15th century Belgium, Jan van Eyck was painting his portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Arnolfini, when in Italy, Donatello was casting this sculpture of David, 
which was the first life-size nude sculpture to be cast since antiquity. And when, Ginevra, when Leonardo was painting Ginevra da Benci, one of his first portraits, somebody in the Dominican Republic was creating this ritualistic zamy of a crouching figure with a receptacle on its head. This Bolivian llama on the left is only about nine centimeters high. Thousands of them were made and used in Inca rituals in the 15th century. Most have not survived because they were melted down by the Spanish in the early days of their conquest of Peru. This particular one was found on the Island of the Sun in late Titicaca and may portray the special white llama that the Inca emperor kept as his pet. It's only one of the surviving examples that still have that blanket on its back. And in spite of its small size, the details of its toenails, its nostrils, and the decorative trim of the blanket are amazing. Rather than a single casting, it is made from several pieces of hammered sheet metal, carefully formed and soldered together. Llamas were actually the most important animal in Andean culture. They, survived, they served as a prime source of wool for clothing, as pack animals, and as a source of meat for food and sacred rites. They were the most precious sacrificial votive after human beings. Another four-legged animal on the right from Sweden, a horse carrying on his back St. George as he kills the dragon. While Michelangelo was working on this dying slave, one of the figures intended for Pope Julius II's tomb in Rome, an unknown painter who interestingly was influenced by Bellini uh, made this beautiful profile study of a scribe. The profile is still static, elegant, and the slave is wrestling his way out of the marble. It seems ironic that the most famous female artist of the Italian Baroque period is perhaps equally known for her traumatic personal history. Allegedly raped in the age of 19, Artemisia Gentileschi was physically tortured during the trial that followed the incident in 1612. Here, she's represented by her most famous work, Judith Beheading Holofenes, from 1613. Symbolic of the triumph of virtue over vice, the Old Testament figure of Judith was a popular subject for Gentileschi. Judith was a rich vid widow, and she charmed her way into the camp of the Assyrian general Holofenes, whose armies were besieging her city. Having plied the general with wine, Judith used his sword to decapitate him, and with the help of her maidservant Abra, returned to her home with the severed head. This painting shows Abra actively assisting her mistress. She hacks the general heads off with a sword. As Holofenes struggles, blood spurts forth from the wound, drenching the fabric below him and cascading towards or outwards in an arc that reaches as far as Judith's arm. Another depiction of a moment close to death, but not quite so gruesome on the right, from India, the dying Inyat Khan. This is a portrait of a courtier who suffered from an addiction to opium and wine. The emperor, Jahangir, who was closely acquainted with the dying man, asked the court doctor to administer a cure and his artist to produce an exact likeness. And this is what we have. In the middle of the 18th century, an English country gentleman and his new, very young wife, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, show us the English countryside that surrounds their home. And on the right, groups of scholars congregate in the Japanese countryside for a poetry conquest. 
I love this pair of six panel screens, whether you look at them as an abstract composition or as a grove of blossoming plum trees on a moonlit night. And Vijay Lebrun's portrait here on the right hand side. Vijay, Elizabeth Vijay Lebrun was one of the most successful portrait painters of the period and at a time when very few women were accepted in the profession. She painted Marie Antoinette, friend and confidant, more than 25 times. All her portraits are intimate like this one. And um, I think this is a very, it's a very gracious portrait and it also gives a glimpse of an 18th century French woman, purposeful and yet feminine. France, neoclassical France on the left. By the time Jean-Jacques David painted this portrait, Napoleon, seated on his horse, was only 28 years old and already a formidable general, having defeated the Austrians in Italy for the second time in five years. Napoleon actually refused to sit for this portrait and instead he sent the uniform that he had worn at the Battle of Marengo. He suggested that he be painted calmly seated on a frisky horse rather than standing with a sword as David had originally suge suggested. This painting is pure propaganda. Here Napoleon is associated with Hannibal and Charlemagne who also crossed the Alps, seen here in the background, and is portrayed as a romantic hero on a rearing horse and wearing flamboyant attire. In reality, Napoleon actually travelled on a donkey and wore a grey coat. When David painted this portrait, he was the most important and influential painter of the neoclassical movement in France. So influential, in fact, that another portrait that he made of Napoleon inspired an artist thousands of miles away in Iran. On the right is a portrait of Fat Ali Shah, one of the Qajar rulers of Iran. Fat Ali Shah, like Napoleon, understood the importance of creating a regal image and commissioned the court painter Mir Ali to paint at least 10 full-length portraits of him. This particular painting shows off Fat Ali Shah's luxurious black beard, rich robes and gem-studded regalia and his swaggering pose is actually modelled on, contem on contemporary portraits of Napoleon in his coronation robes. This book shows us how works from entirely different cultures appear similar. When Delacroix was depicting the debauched scene of the death of Sardanapalus, Tanai Buncho was drawing dragons. And at the same time, Hokusai was making his views, 36 views of Mount Fuji. And J.M.W. Turner was painting a snowstorm at sea. All four of these works, painted within a very short period of each other in different parts of the globe, do have something very similar with them, with the swirling lines. They're almost all, almost Baroque. But the book also shows us that from work that works from different uh, cultures that are more similar actually seem so different. When Ilya Repin on the left, the great Russian socialist realist, was painting a group of peasants hauling a barge upstream against the current, asking us, the viewer, to admire the strength and endurance of the Russian working man, Claude Monet was content with painting the good things in life. A lunch just finished, two ladies walking in the garden, a child playing with toys, a warm afternoon of dappled sunlight. 30,000 years of art plows on into the 20th century and art history is studied even more specifically and in smaller, more distinct sections. In the 20th century, every few years, a new movement or style emerges. But here we see them side by side in the order that they were produced. Expressionism, side by side with Cubism. 
two portraits, two entirely different ways of recreating an image of a person. One, brightly colored on the left, a self-portrait. The artist depicts himself, confronting the viewer with his female model seated at the right. In livid colors and reduced angular shapes that disrupt ordinary perspective, filling the composition with sort of smoldering intensity. The other painting by Georges Braque is almost monochrome. Again, everything is distorted. Perspective here has been entirely, almost it has been entirely shattered. Kirchner's physical subject matter is clear for us to see. Braque's is not. The subject matter is hardly recognizable. But still, the image is not completely abstract. The lettering suggests the type on bottles of alcohol or posters hanging in a bar. The remnants of an instrument are visible in the lower center. And the painting is called Le Portugais. This is a portrait of a man, probably Portuguese, playing music in a bar. In the 1930s, René Magritte was asking questions about reality and what we really see and how we should look at things. And Diego Rivera was making politically charged statements about the progressive forces of technology and science and how they direct the universe. Two decades after this, a group of 17 men sat in the Cedar Bar in New York and after a lot of alcohol, they decided that they needed to overturn the dominance of European art and find a brand new form of art that was relevant to them and not just a hand-me-down from a different time. This was the abstract expressionists. Barnett Newman was one of these 17. And this is one of his zip paintings in which one or more vertical lines punctuate an expansive field of pure color. It's difficult to see here, and in the flesh, it makes a completely different impact. But this luminous zip, the line of white through the middle of the picture, somehow communes with the blueness in which it floats so that the two forces intensify each other. Francis Bacon's painting of exactly the same year, 1953, couldn't be more different. It's figurative, it's screaming, it's painterly, it's emotional, and it's disturbing. Two works that integrate the landscape. One in a sculpture park in New York State on the right, the other on the coast near San Sebastian. This extraordinary work by Eduardo Chilida Emerging from the rocks and communing with the sea seems to encapsulate within it the force and power of nature. 30,000 years is an enormous time span. It puts a lot into perspective, particularly as you come to the more recent past. If we look back hundreds and hundreds of years, it's already established what the masterpieces are. But when we're looking at the very, very close history, it's more difficult. How do we know what will last? How do we know what will become the masterpieces of tomorrow? So, for example, we have only included one piece of video art, which is by Bruce Nauman, and only one artist who uses photography, Jeff Wall. Somehow, this massive overview of human creativity over such a long period, it makes you very, very selective about what is really going to last. A Sudden Gust of Wind After Hokusai by Jeff Wall on the right, next to, um, next to uh, Coons on the left, Jeff Coons on the left, two Jeffs on the same page. Um, is based, so a sudden gust of wind, is based on a 19th century woodblock print. It is actually a photograph um, by, um, so it's based on a 19th century print by Hokusai, in which a group of travelers loses a stack of paper to the wind. Wall's tableau, Jeff Wall's tableau, uses the same composition, but sets the group of figures in a modern post-industrialist landscape. Although the photograph appears to be a snapshot capturing a single moment in time, in reality, Wall spent months composing and perfecting its elements and details with digital photographic tools. 
Wall's contribution, therefore, is more akin to art than photography. This, not wor this work is not related to documenting life, which I believe is what photography is all about, but to creating an artistic composition in the tradition of painting. It's no different, to my mind, to Claude Lorrain's um, amazing uh, landscapes um, or anything that Turner did. To me, it's the same thing. It's somebody composing something out of different elements and really focusing on making a composition. With a photograph, the composition exists already. In addition to the standard glossaries and things to explain art historical terminology, the book also includes two timelines. One seen here that maps all the various movements and cultures in chronological order so that you can see them at a glance. And a second timeline that charts across the top two thirds of the page all the 1,000 entries showing which country they're from so you can see which cultures were particularly strong at which particular time. And in the lower band of the page um, are charted major historical and cultural events that have shaped the world's history. So we can place the creation of these works of art in our own uh, political history. Um, this is a massive book. It has over a thousand pages. It took five years to make with 44 contributors, an editorial team of about 10, but it's based on a very, very simple idea. By juxtaposing works of art from different cultures throughout time, this book offers an appraisal of world art history, revealing the huge diversity of man's artistic achievements through time across the globe. 30,000 years of art, the story of human creativity across time and space. It takes us from the Lion Man, one of the oldest known sculptures in the world of a two-legged figure with the head of a lion to a work that is still not finished. The American artist, James Terrell, is working in an enormous crater in the middle of the Arizona desert, making tunnels and apertures like this. Here we're inside the crater looking out. And the create crater in which he's working was probably created way before the first work in this book was made. That is the story of the book. Thank you.